Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala anbiya illahi jami'an. Wa ala khatamihim habibi ilahi al-alameen. Abil Qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad. Wa ala ahli bayteh al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Siyama sayyidina wa maulana al-imam. المهدي المنتظر عجل الله تعالى فرجه وسهل مخرجه أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فمن حاجك فيه من بعد ما جاءك من العلم فقل تعالوا ندع أبناءنا وأبناءكم ونساءنا ونساءكم وأنفسنا وأنفسكم ثم نبتهل فنجعل لعنة الله على الكاذبين صدق الله العلي العظيم it has been said that your grandchildren would be closer to you and maybe more beloved to you than your own children. And if you don't believe in that, wait until you become a grandmother and a grandfather. I assure you, you will be one of those we're going to be so much attached to your grandchildren. And the Prophet of Islam, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is no exception to this, to this rule. So when he was told that his beloved daughter Fatima to Zahra, she gave her very first baby boy on the 15th of the month of Ramadan, the third year after they settled in Medina after the Hijrah, the Prophet was overwhelmed with jubilation, with joy and happiness. And he rushed to the room of Fatima alayhi salam and he took the baby and he kissed the baby. And he asked Imam Ali alayhi salam, did you name him? He said, Ya Rasulullah, ma kuntu li asbiqaka ila dhalik. I would not race before you. I would not name my son before you yourself, you name him. So the Prophet suggested that name him Hassan, the first grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first son to Lady Fatima and Amir al muminin one of the happiest moments in the life of the Prophet and the family of the Prophet. And historians say Imam Hassan was very similar. He took after his grandfather in his physical complexion and his manner. And this is what the Prophet said to him. The Prophet one day said to him while he was a baby, he said, Ya Hassan, ashbahta khalqi wa khuluqi. You, you are so close, so similar. You took after my khalqi, which is physical complexion, my face, my physical character, wa khuluqi, and my manner too. And one of the manners that Imam Hassan inherited from his grandfather, the Prophet wasallam, was the generosity of the Prophet, as I'm going to speak about it soon, inshallah. One of the legacies of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, our second Imam, al-Imam al-Hasan al-Mujtaba or al-Hasan al-Sibt is mentioned in the books of history that someone came to him, one of his close companions, while Imam Hassan was dying. He lived for 47 years. He was born on the 3rd of Hijrah and he was poisoned and killed on the 50th, so he lived for almost 47 years. And he died almost 10 years before his younger brother, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He said to him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, Idni, admonish me, advise me. It's a beautiful that we can find a trustworthy friend, a learned friend, an experienced friend in this life who can give us some advice. 
We all need to be advised. We all need to be reminded. Always. Every single day. Every morning we need to be reminded. Midday we have to be reminded. At night we have to be reminded of our responsibilities in this life. Of our journey in this life. So Imam Hassan did not say, him, say to him, listen, I am poisoned now. I don't feel good. I don't feel well. I'm dizzy. I have high fever. Leave me alone. He said, yes, I'm going to advise you. And this is one of the most beautiful pieces of will, wasiyya, that has ever been produced by an imam. The first thing he said to him, na'am, Indeed, be ready for your trip. We have a trip. We have a trip ahead of us. This is mandatory trip. Even if you don't like traveling, even if you want to stay at home, this is a trip you have to take. You have no choice. And this trip is not 1,000 miles or 5,000 miles or 10,000 miles. This trip God knows how many miles it would be and how long it's going to be. Sometimes we take a trip for one week, one month, maximum one year, and then we come back home. But this trip, there is no return here. There is no return to this home. You go to another home, a permanent home. استعد لسفرك. استعد means be prepared. Any time of the day, any time of the night, we don't know what happened next. I was looking at my phone book. When I came to America, I had a phone book. You know, at that time, you did not have these smartphones. So you have to save the, the telephone numbers in a phone book. I found it the other day among my papers, and I was reading through it. Maybe 70% of those people are dead no longer. No longer there. And the other 30% are going to leave, including myself. This is a reality. The other day I saw a picture of Salatul Eid here in this mosque. Some people who were sitting in that corner here, they are no longer with us. They left. They left. Look at your family pictures of 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Look at it and see how many of them they survived. Maybe half of them are gone. This is a reality, a reality that we do not want to accept. We are very reluctant, reluctant to accept this reality. But it's a reality. It's a fact. It's a fact. Imam Ali says, nothing in this life, nothing true in this life, very true, it's a fact, like death, where people are treated as what? Huh? Treat, treated as fiction. They don't treat it as fact. When they see someone die, they say, hey, he died, not me. Death, Israel, only goes to that neighborhood, to that house, to this. One day he comes to us too. We need to wake up. Enough playing. Enough forgetfulness. Enough. We have to prepare for that trip. وَحَصَّلْ زَادَكْ Zad, in Farsi they say to Shah. In English, provision. In Arabic, Zad. Zad means what you carry in your, in your carry-on luggage. What do you carry when you, when you go to the East Coast in your carry-on? You carry what you need, things that are important, very important. Things that you cannot survive without them. Imam Hassan says, this trip, you need to prepare your provision. وَحَصَّلْ زَادَكَ قَبْلَ حُلُولِ أَجَلِكَ Before Ajal arrives. Because when Ajal arrives, when death arrives, Israel does not give us any chance. No delay on time. Israel is so perfect when it comes to time. Respecting time is number one. Because he is back to back. Miskin, he's working 24-7. No rest. He moves from this house to that neighborhood. 
to the to Africa, to Asia, to India. He moves around. I cannot tell him, please give me five minutes. He says, I can't, five minutes. In this five minutes, I have to take the soul of 500 people. Yalla. You have to leave. Evacuation. Immediate evacuation. وَحَصِّلْ زَادَكَ قَبْلَ حُلُولِ أَجَلِكَ وَعْلَمْ أَنَّكَ تَطْلُبُ الدُّنْيَا وَالْمَوْتُ يَطْلُبُكَ Subhanallah. Always with love, we are seekers of this dunya. Seekers to stay in this dunya longer and longer and longer. Even if one day is longer, is good. But death is seeking you. We seek the dunya, but death is seeking me. He's running after me. And then he says, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ فِي حَلَالِهَا حساب. Even the halal that we make, halal income, there is accountability. The IRS there is very strict. They don't let go of anyone. Even the halal that you receive and you make, you have to give an answer about it. Where? How did you generate this money? Where did this money come from? How did you spend this money? How did you spend it? Did you spend it in a way to build yourself, to build your family, to build your country, or to destroy your country, to destroy your health? Some people who spend their money on, on cigarettes, on, on, on drugs, on alcohol, they are destroying themselves. Yes, it is their money. Yes, they are free, but they're going to be accountable. God said, I gave you this money to take care of your health. To take care of yourself. Not to go and, and, and buy destructive substances with it. Not to destroy your health. You can't tell God that it was my money. I'm free. You can say to this to your poor mother. To your poor father when you yell at them. But you cannot yell at God tomorrow. God says this money I gave it to you to build yourself. And then he says, وَعْمَلْ لِدُنْيَاكِ This is golden rules, golden rules. I have never heard of my life rules like this. Golden. وَعْمَلْ لِدُنْيَاكَ كَأَنَّكَ تَعِيشُ أَبَدًا وَعْمَلْ لِآخِرَتِكَ كَأَنَّكَ تَمُوتُ غَدًا Work hard for this life as if you are going to live for 10 million years. And work hard for the akhirah, the hereafter, as if you are going to die tomorrow. It's not, it's not possible. It's really not possible to con reconcile between these two. It's not possible. Working as if I live for 10 million years, and then working for the akhirah as if I'm dying tomorrow, how? I'm going to tell you how. Some people, they give up on this life. They don't go to school. They hate school. They don't get a job. They hate to work. They don't get married. They hate marriage and family. They don't have any responsibility. They have no whatever. They have no friends. Why? Because why should I get married if I am going to get divorced tomorrow? Why should I go to school if I don't get a job? Why should I work if money is not going to help me? And why, 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 why? This is wrong. This is wrong. God wants you to go to school. God wants you to be hopeful, to have hope in tomorrow. Things are going to change. You, most of you, you came to America, most of you, most of the people, the immigrants who came from Indian subcontinent, from Middle East, from Africa, from North Africa. They were penniless. Most of them, they didn't have money. They were barefoot. Alhamdulillah, now you are multimillionaires, many of you. Alhamdulillah. Some of you did not have education. Now we have the best education. Some of you did not have homes, properties, family, children. Now you have. You are different. We have to be hopeful. We survive on hope. On hope, hope in God. We cannot give up in this life. We cannot stay at home and be overtaken by 
boredom, by fatigue, by weakness, by anxiety, by uncertainty, by fear. You can't. You have to change this. You have to change this. And always be hopeful that tomorrow, next week, next month is going to be better than this week and this month and this year. Always be hopeful. Always be hopeful. So work for this life as if you are living forever. Because if you start counting, see my friends, one of the reasons God does not tell us about the date of our death, why he doesn't tell us. Because if God says in two years you're going to die, you're not going to work, you're going to just to gather money for two years, that's it. You're going to be depressed. You are not going to enjoy food. You are not going to enjoy Ramadan. You are not going to enjoy Eid because Israel is coming to me in two years. So God does not tell you. God wants you to be energetic, be hopeful to work. You have to build this life. Why? Because Akhirah, how do we get the hereafter through this one? Ad dunya mazra'atul akhirah, the hadith says. The hadith says, the narration says, this life is the plantation for the akhirah. Plantation. The, the hadith says, Man la ma'asha lahu, la ma'ada lahu. If you don't have good life, most likely you are not going to have good akhirah and good hereafter too. You are not going to have good, good hereafter. So you have to work to build this life. To be self-sufficient. To be independent, not to be, not to be always dependent on your parents, on your brothers, on your community members. No. One of the things that I am sad about, them, sad about it here in America. You know, in Ramadan, how many phone calls we receive from people throughout the day and the night? They are asking for charity, for sadaqah. People who live in this country, there, there are jobs available. Any job. You know, sometimes I watch janitors who come and clean this masjid here. When we leave, they come at 1 a.m. 1 a.m. Some of them are very young in their 20s. Some of them are in their 60s. They come and they clean. They get money. And they thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can do anything in this country. Jobs are available. But sometimes when I am lazy... I reject this one, I reject that one. No, this is not for me. No, no, I am fulan. I am, my father is this, my mother is that. I should not do this. The Prophet was a shepherd. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best human being in this entire universe. He was a shepherd, a shepherd. He was a shepherd. Some prophets were carpenters. Some others were blacksmiths. Imam Ali was a farmer. If I say to any one of my community members, go and work as a farmer, he says, you are insulting me. Farmer? Me? Farmer? Imam Ali was a farmer. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? There is nothing that is wrong when I am dependent on others. This is the wrong. In this country, there are jobs. Go and work. Go on a study. Go on develop yourself. God wants you to be developed day by day. Day by day developed. Because when you work for your family, you are working for the akhirah. You are building this life. When you work for your kids, to protect your kids, to feed your kids, to educate your kids, to send them to good schools, you are working for your akhirah. You are working for that life, not just this life. When you work to, to buy a house for yourself, a good house. Someone came to Imam al-Sadiq. He said to him, Allah, O Imam, please ask Allah that the dunya opens up for me. Means I make money. Imam al-Sadiq said, what do you do with it? With the dunya? He said, because first I want to buy a house. I don't have a house. I have a family, no house. He said, what else? 
He said, because I want to feed my relatives. What is the third thing? He said, I want to reach out to the poor and help them. Imam said, all these things are working for the akhirah, not the dunya. All what you mentioned, this amal, these deeds are dedicated for the akhirah. If you buy a house, you are working for the akhirah because you want to lead a dignified life. You don't want to be homeless in the street. Yesterday, there was an article in the New York Times about LA's mayor, Karen Bass. Since she came, the article says, since she came to office a year ago, she was able to clean some areas in LA from homeless people. Hundreds of people, thousands of people were cleared and she, she settled them in hotels and motels. She cleaned the areas. They said in the past, during pandemic and after, you could not even walk. A lady, a man could not. It was unsafe. Thousands of people are crammed on pavements, makeshift camps. This is not good. This is not good for the country. This is not good for the people. This is not good for health. This is not good for safety and security. God wants us to be independent. Have your own house. Work. Have a big house so you can host your family members. You can host your friends. This is working for the Akhirah. There were two brothers during the time of Imam Ali. One of them used to come to the mosque and stay in the mosque 24 7. The other one used to come once in a while, Friday prayers, you know, once in a while to the mosque. This one who used to come to the mosque disappeared for a long time. So Imam Ali saw his brother who comes to the mosque once in a while, once in a while. He said to him, where is your brother? I don't see him. He said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, my brother, he is sitting at home, locking the door. He's worshiping Allah. Ruku' sujood, ruku' sujood. He's fasting, he's praying. Imam Ali said, does he have a family? He said, yeah, he has a family. He said, who spends on his family? He said, me, I am his brother. He said, Wallah al-Azim, you are one of the people of Jannah. You are the people. The one who is going, not your brother. Your brother neglected his family, abandoned them. He does not spend on them. And we have many fathers in the community in this country like that. I hear stories from mothers that the father abandoned his kids. He doesn't meet them. He doesn't see them. He doesn't give them money. What sort of life is this? Are you seeking akhira through closing the door? God wants you to rukuk sujood, rukuk sujood, 24-7? Is this Islam? You are a freeloader? This is not acceptable. Salat is, salat is a fueling. Salat is going to the gas station. How many times you go to the gas station? Alhamdulillah, I don't go anymore. <laughs> thanks to Tesla. But usually in California, three times, you know, I mean, twice a week maybe, or maybe three times a week. But not every day. Prayers is a fueling, fueling, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. After that, I go and work. I go and serve. I go and help. I go and contribute to my country, to my society. Imam said to him, you are going to go to paradise, not him. He's a freeloader. He's a freeloader. When you work, when you have a dignified life, you are on a carpool, fast lane to paradise. Working, we should not separate between working for the dunya and akhirah. We shouldn't separate. They are, they are the same. same. However, however, remember this. Remember this. <clears throat> when you work for the dunya and you make money, don't get attached to your money. Use the money. Don't let the money use it. Many people allow the money to use them, to control them. They don't control their money. The money controls them. This is the problem. Some people, they have money, and with this money, they do stupid things with this money. And when you ask him why, this is unnecessary. He says, I have money. What shall I do with my money? 
Does it mean when you have extra money, you have to destroy yourself? And it is beside, beside. How about others who do not have money? Allah says, وَفِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ حَقٌ لِلسَّائِلِ وَالْمَحْرُومِ Part of my money does not belong to me, even if it is in my bank account. It does not belong to me. It belongs to those who are needy, to the orphans, to the widows, to people who are sick, people who are under bombardment in many countries, including Gaza and other countries. Doesn't mean you have to waste this money because it is yours. So don't let money to control you. I said something two, two nights ago. Enjoy your home. You must enjoy your home. Your home is your nest. Like the birds. Have you seen how much the birds, they like their nest? Your home is your nest. Keep it clean, cozy, beautiful. But don't get attached to this home. Love your home, but don't get attached. Why? Because one day we have to leave this. One day we have to say bye to this home. We lived in this home 20 years, 30 years, maybe 50 years. Maybe this is the home of your father, your grandfather. In some countries, in the Middle East, families, they live in homes that they inherited from their grandfathers. The home is 100 years old. Ancient, but don't get attached to it. Because your grandfather used to live here and he left. Your parents used to live in this house, they left. You live for some years and then you leave because your children are going to come. If you go to Cuba, how many of you have been to Cuba? Inshallah, you go one day. You pass by some apartments, I saw this with my eyes. Apartment, three generations live in that apartment, three generations. Grandparents, parents, and the children. And they are married. And when you ask them why, they say, we don't have money to rent or to buy. We don't have. Three generations. But then we have to leave. We have to leave these properties. We should not get attached to them. We should be able to detach ourselves, disconnect yourself. Disconnect yourself anytime. Anytime they say you have to leave, you disconnect immediately. You say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Imam al Hassan alayhi salatu was salam. See his generosity. Sometimes generosity is with money. You give food. You give medicine, you give your own clothing. Sometimes some women, they give their own jewelry for good causes. This is generosity. This is good with material things. Sometimes it's not just you give your money. You give yourself. You give your good manners. You give a smile. You give kindness. You give love. Sometimes love is more precious than money. Many people, they have money, but they lack love. Nobody loves them. And their health deteriorates. When you feel you are unloved, nobody appreciates you, nobody values you, your health will deteriorate. Many people, they suffer from this. They have vacuum, emotional vacuum. Nobody says to them, I love you, I care about you. Nobody contacts them. Nobody asks about them. They are abandoned. This is not good. This is, has a, a very terrible psychological fallback. It's terrible. So sometimes you can give some people love and care and attention through your smile, through your salam, through how are you, through I miss you, through these beautiful, these, these are free. You don't have to spend money. Give your love. Give your care. Imam Hassan used to do this. He's not only generous in his money, but in his manners too, in his akhlaq. One day he was doing tawaf around the Kaaba. A man came to him. He said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I need you to come to help me. Imam said, now or after the tawaf? He said, now. Imam cut off his tawaf. And he goes and he helps the man. When he comes back, that some Muslims 
They say to him, Yabna Rasulullah, you should have completed the seventh round and you could have gone and helped him. He said the man was in a state of emergency. He was distressed. He could not wait. He could not wait. I went, I fulfilled his needs. God has given me the credit of 70 tawafs. 70, 70. Why do we do tawaf? What's the reason for tawaf? Tawaf is God is the center of my life. Center of my life. If God is center of my life, then I have to reach out to people. I have to help them. Another example of his generosity and kindness that a person comes to him and this person was brainwashed like so many people today. They are brainwashed. They misunderstand Islam. They misunderstand the school of Ahlul Bayt. They misunderstand because they've been brainwashed. So during the time of the Imam, there were Ahlul Bayt had so many enemies because they were brainwashed by the propaganda of the Umayyad regime. Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan. Muawiyah, he had an amazing propaganda machine. Even CNN, CBS, they cannot rival with him today. He hires a group of liars. He pays them money. And those liars, they go to every masjid in every country, especially in Syria, Bilad al-Sham. And they start fabricating hadith against Ahlul Bayt. One of the hadiths that Imam Ali does not pray. You know, people were shocked when they heard during the month of Ramadan, in a few nights from now, in four or five nights from now, when Imam Ali is struck in the Grand Mosque of Kufa, the people of Syria were surprised. Why Ali goes to the masjid? Ali is not supposed to go to the masjid because he doesn't pray. People were shocked. What does Ali have to do with the masjid? He doesn't pray. That was the propaganda. So this man comes filled with this negative propaganda against Imam Hassan and the family of the Prophet. So he comes, he stands, Imam Hassan is walking in the street in public. He curses Imam Hassan in his face. If someone does this to you, what would be your reaction? Honestly, would you smile? If you say only why, you are an angel. If you just say why. Most people, they use their shoes, you know. They take off their shoes. Oh, you don't do that, alhamdulillah. You are an angel. Let's see, let's see. It hasn't happened to you. But we, who knows? At the time of anger, we forget ourselves, you know? We lose control at the time of anger. Shaitan comes and, and penetrates your mind and your soul and corrupts your work. So most of the times we retaliate. Spontaneously we retaliate. Okay? Most of the time we retaliate. But if you have self-control and you can smile, this is amazing. This is a miracle. And this is exactly what religion is all about. This is what the month of Ramadan and fasting is all about. To exercise self-control at the time of anger, at the time of frustration. We don't say something bad. Imam al-Hassan smiled. The man is cursing him, the Imam is smiling. I haven't seen in my life. I have not seen in my life someone being cursed in public and then he smiles. I haven't seen. Maybe you've seen, alhamdulillah, but I haven't. I haven't. And I lived in so many countries. I've seen so many communities and societies. Imam smiled. He said, ayyuha shaykh. In Arabic, when you address someone as shaykh, mean an honorable man. Shaykh in Arabic vocabulary means an honorable, respected man. He said to him, ayyuha shaykh. I assume that you are new in this town, غريب. You are a guest in this town. 
Kunta jā'i'an ashba'nāk. If you are hungry, we will fill your stomach with food. Aw uriyānan kasawnāk. Or if you are any cloth, we will clothe you. If you are naked, we will clothe you. Aw muhtājan aghnaynāk. If you have a need, we will fulfill it for you. Aw tarīdan awaynāk. Tarīd means someone who is homeless. He doesn't have a shelter. We will shelter you. The man was dumbfounded. The man was shocked. The man being told that those family of the Prophet Imam Hassan is an evil man. Is an evil man. And then he comes, he curses him, and this is the answer of Imam Hassan. These are miracles, my friend. These are miracles. And none can do this except Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad alayhi wasallam. The man said, you know what was the reaction of the man? He said, he started to cry first. He was crying and crying. He said, Ashhadu annaka khalifatullahi fi Allah. You, you are the vicegerent of Allah in his land. Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'alu risalatah. God knows best who choose to carry his message. You are worthy of carrying the message of God. And then he says, Kunta anta wa abuk abghadu khalqillahi ilay. You and your father Ali was the most hated in my eyes a minute ago. Now, walaan anta wa abuk ahabbu khalqillahi ta'ala ilay. Now, within one minute, two minutes, you and your father Ali are the most beloved people to my heart. This is generosity. Generosity is not when you give only food and money. Generosity is when you shelter, you have a heart as big as this universe, where you can shelter even your enemies, your opponents, people who curse you, you can shelter them in your heart. This is generosity. This is karam. This is the legacy of Ahlul Bayt. This is why Ahlul Bayt are different from all others. His brother Imam Hussein, two hours before his martyrdom on the sand dune of Karbala, two hours, he cries when he sees the army. His sister says, Ya Aba Abdullah, are you crying of fear because you're going to die? He said, no, I have no fear of death. I have no fear of martyrdom. I'm crying because of this army which is going to murder me soon. And they're going to go to hellfire because of me. I am crying for them, for their fate. This is generosity. This is kindness and goodness. This is the big heart. This is a heart which is bigger than the sun. This is a heart which is bigger than this galaxy. This is the heart of those who are connected to God. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow on us a big heart, inshallah. To make our hearts merciful, forgiving, loving, compassionate, considerate, thoughtful, and close to him, inshallah. To fill our hearts with mercy, with the blessings, inshallah, especially during the nights of Qadr, the nights of Dua, the nights of petition, the nights of insisting on Allah, insisting on Him to change our, our hearts, our souls. Inshallah ta'ala. Allahumma khfar lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat. The first night of Qadr is going to be Friday, inshallah. This coming Friday. Yes, the first night. The second will be Sunday. The third will be Tuesday, inshallah. And meanwhile, we're going to have a programs, inshallah. Tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday at 8.30, 8.45. And Thursday, Friday, uh, Saturday and Sunday are going to be with iftar at sunset, inshallah. Allahumma khfar lil mu'minina wal mu'minat wal muslimina wal muslimat al ahya'i minhum wal amwat tabi' allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat innaka mujibu al-da'awat taqabbal salatana wa siyamana wa du'aana fi hadha al-shahr al-azim 
وإلى أرواح شهداء فلسطين وغزة ولبنان ثواب الفاتحة مع الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد